I made a handout. Mike is handing out the um, uh, the summary to the worker protection standard. Um, that was uh, the, the new rule that was passed back in October. Um, so there are quite a few changes in there um, as opposed to what you previously were used to. So um, that is a summer sheet that you guys can take a look at. Um, as far as other updates go, I'm, you're going to see me skip over a few slides here. Um, we don't have a huge, huge slide presentation this year, so we combined our commercial and our private uh, talks. Uh, so if you see me flying by a few slides, that, um, that's why. Uh, so anyway, just so you just give you guys an idea on what we're doing certification wise. I mean, we have certified almost 4,700 uh, certified commercial applicators, um, 3,426 private applicators. And then as a, as a commercial business, you, you, you can either be certified uh, if, if your employees aren't certified, then they have to be registered with us. And we have nearly 8,500 registered employees um, that we're working with. Um, this past summer, uh, many of you know, especially those of you who have been around for a while, know Mary Ellen Setting. She started off in the pesticide regulation section um, as an entomologist uh, and uh, worked her way up to chief, to assistant secretary, and eventually deputy secretary. Well, after almost 40 years, I believe, um, she retired over the summer. And uh, Jim Mycorst has taken her position. So um, we wish, certainly wish her well. She is definitely going to be missed. Um, she was a good ally to have as a deputy secretary, at least for the pesticide regulation section anyway. So. But Jim has been pretty good to work with. Um, he's pretty approachable, and uh, just as Mary Ellen was. So hopefully things will go nice and smooth. Um, and again, a lot of you guys have seen this slide. Um, we'll just keep it in there one more time. Um, Ed Crow did retire again. Um, 33 years and 11 months. Couldn't quite make that last month, I guess. He just needed to get out. But, um, but anyway, he, he actually left us. He retired, went back to his, his old home uh, in Pennsylvania where he grew up. Uh, he's actually working with Penn State Extension, um, basically doing what he did for MDA. Um, but on his terms now. So uh, we do have a new website. Uh, Ashley Jones, who has been with us for a year, who has taken Ed's position, um, redid the licensing and certification side of our website. It's it's a little bit more user friendly um, than it has been for, for any of you guys who have been to our website. It's 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 a great website if you know exactly where you're going. Otherwise, it's you're pretty much lost. But um, once you get to that licensing and certification side, if uh, most of our manuals are in there uh, for any, any of you who need to do any testing, um, all of our approved recertification courses are listed. Um, if you miss one of the courses and you got to, you got to, you've, you know, your, your deadline's coming up and you've really got to get that, that uh, certification renewed. Uh, we do have some online recertification courses that you can take uh, that are also listed on that site. Um, and for the first time in a long time, this is actually up to date. So, and again, we do have these online research courses. Um, obviously, you're here today. You're good to go. Um, if you do miss a course, you know, if you do miss a training session, whether because you're sick or, or whatever the case may be, um, you can take one of these online courses. Um, it's pretty quick, pretty easy. Um, there is one stipulation with that, and it is once every three years. Of course, a private applicator certificate is good for three years, but um, we haven't, uh, it's, it's more geared towards the commercial side of things, but it will work for you as well. We do have an online renewal system now, um, so everything is being done uh, that way. You still can mail your stuff into MDA. Um, that is fine. And uh, I think a lot of the, 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 the private uh, applicators have done it that way. But this is, we've worked through quite a few bugs. Um, it, it is generally, has gotten a little bit easier. Um, you can go online, 
once you pay your, your certificate fee, you can print your certificate out right there. So you'll have it. Uh, plant product um, that would be treated with the neonicotinoid, that labeling will have to be done um, prior to its sale in Maryland. <clears throat> if, um, if you want to sell neonicotinoids, if you're, uh, you would have to be an actual restricted use dealer. Um, so basically what this bill would do is ne the neonicotinoids that are available to today are not restricted use pesticides, they're general use. Um, basically what this bill would do is, is restrict it. Um, you can only apply it if you're a certified applicator. Again, this, this wouldn't apply to, to farmers or veterinarians or, um, uh, but it is out there. Um, not sure how the hearings went. So. Does that mean that plants sold commercially um, for the public that have been treated with neonics will be labeled? They would have to be. They they would be required to be labeled if this bill passes. If it passes. If it passes. So and that has not passed yet. Um, this. This doesn't just affect the pesticide regulation section. This kind of affects three or four different sections within the Department of Ag. Um, logistically, it will be a nightmare um, to enforce. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, unless they give us everything that, that, that we would require. Um, I mean, I would, I would need to increase my inspection staff by five, probably, um, just for the pesticide side of things. Um, so it, it, we're not sure where it's going to go. Um, but. It's been proposed before. Uh, this is the second year in a row now this has come up. So again, it won't, it won't, it doesn't affect you all directly, but indirectly it may, so. Um, one other thing, uh, real quick, again, this doesn't, this, this is just something that, that uh, House Bill 132, uh, which again is requiring um, all state agencies or s state property to, um, to uh, come up with some sort of pollinator habitat plan. Um, I do believe state highways probably fighting this one pretty, pretty strongly um, because that would be, that, that means all those median strips as well. So, but, uh, but that is out there as well. So enforcement wise, um, we, we, we've been working really with only three three inspectors out in the field, really two full-time inspectors out in the field. We do have a supervising inspector, PD Council, who works on the Eastern Shore. Um, Glenn Kraut is, is in the um, northern part of Maryland, who unfortunately has been, been dogged with some health issues. So we've, we've really been down to two to three inspectors here. Uh, we lost two a couple years ago. We started, a uh, new hire started today. Um, so we did add a, uh, another inspector today. Um, it's an old inspector. He actually left us and went to D.C. a couple years ago, and uh, Russ Nortel, and he is back with us again uh, as of today. So I'm going to skip right through those. <laughs> um, so complaint investigations in, in 2015. Um, I can't, I don't know how many pesticide applications are made in the state of Maryland, you know, whether you're a commercial applicator, whether you're a private applicator, whether you're a homeowner. Um, but really, complaint-wise, we only had about 41 complaints um, throughout 2015. And um, on the ag side, uh, 10, 10 complaints, uh, all of which were drift. So on the ag side, 10 complaints, five on commercial ground companies. Uh, four on commercial aerial, and we did have one on a private applicator. Um, the over time, we've kind of been been stagnant. 213 was a was a good year for ag complaints. Um, 2013, I mean, but uh, uh, we've we've been in that six, eight, ten range pretty much every year, um, and for as long as I can remember, probably about. 95 to 98 percent of them all are drift related. Violation wise, however, um, these are confirmed complaints. So, I mean, really, out of those six, eight, or ten complaints, we're really only confirming roughly two. So, we're unable to confirm drift on, on most, most of these complaints. So, 
Um, so federal updates. So um, again, you got a handout on the on the worker protection standard changes. Um, there are definitely some changes coming across the board that will will affect, well, may affect how you operate. Um, workers had to be trained. There, there was a 30-day grace period um, under the old provision. Under the new provision, uh, they will have to be trained immediately. Uh, so as soon as they start for you all, they, they will need to go through their pesticide safety training. Uh, or if they're, they're spraying, they'll have to go through their handler training. Um, that training can only be conducted by certified applicators. Um, or uh, those folks who have gone through a train the trainer course, but I don't think there's been a train the trainer program since about 94. So um, basically, if you're a certified applicator, you can, you can train these folks. We do work with a company, a, a nonprofit out of Salisbury called Telemon Corporation. Um, they do a lot of training here on the shore. Uh, they will go over west of the bridge. Um, a couple times a year for those growers, if they can get a bunch of growers together on that side, uh, they'll go over for a couple days and, and get those guys trained too. But um, I don't know if I've got Telemon's number anywhere, but if, if you can't find it, you can always give us a call. I'll pass that along. Um, Go back when that last new content. Um, basically, they're giving us they're giving you all a two year grace period on this. So um, the the rule was finalized October 2015. By October 2017 is when when it all takes effect. So there there is a two year period to to get into compliance um, before any type of enforcement would take place. Um, one thing that might affect some of you, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, if you have a, a handler, so any, anyone that is not certified, that has just gone through the handler training to, to do some applications for you, that person needs to be 18. Um, if you have any early entry workers, now those would be workers that are going into the field prior to the uh, res restricted entry interval expiring. Um, they also would have to be 18. Um, that, that wasn't in there before. Now, of course, we all don't care about your own family. You can do whatever you want with them. So, <laughs> so but um, again, immediate family, as it was before, immediate family is exempt. And, and family members are exempt from a lot of the, the uh, worker protection standard um, measures. So. Uh, they did actually, EPA did expand what immediate family means. Um, so it does include cousins and, and things like that. So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> twice removed. Um, respirator and fit testing must be, must be done before any application, before any handling task. So if you've got anybody that's going out in the field, um, any employee that's going out in the field, whether they're certified or whether they're a handler employee, uh, they must go through OSHA approved fit test, uh, respirator fit test training. Um, that records of that training need to be maintained. Um, so you need to, you need to hold on to that. Uh, records of your safety training also need to be maintained now before they weren't required to be maintained. Uh, but now they have to be maintained for a period of two years as well. So, uh, Specific water amounts have gone up, a gallon for each worker, three gallons for each handler. Again, follow the label. Um, the label will address a lot of these changes. Again, EPA's website is really not all that simple, but if you, if whatever search engine you want to use, just, just search EPA OPP, and once you get to their page, Search WPS, and it'll it'll bring you to that um, to that fact sheet that I handed out um, for you guys to take a look at. One other thing that that I forgot to put on here um, that is a change um, on the ag side of things is set, uh, 
buffer requirements. So um, I believe it's a 100 foot buffer requirement now. So if you've got somebody working, if you're spraying a block of, of apples, let's just say, or, or whatever it might be, and you've got somebody working in an area that's 100 foot from that, air, that, that spray block, um, they're gonna have to get out of there. That applicator will be required to stop spraying. Um, until those until those workers move out of that that area, that that's across the board now. It used to only it used to only be f subject to, to uh, nursery folks, and it, it depended on the type of application. Now it's it's any any application, ground aerial, whatever it might be. Uh, it's a hundred foot buffer. So. So pollinators, I. I Jumped in here. I got here. I guess when um, Kelly was talking about the the, the, the pollinator box. Um, I'll tell you from an enforcement perspective, um, us enforcement people really hate the labels, probably just as much as you all do. Um, they're, they're they're a tough. Uh, they're. I'll be honest. A lot of what she was putting on her board is going to be tough for us to enforce. Um, you know, it's, it, unless we're actually in the field with you. Um, so one thing that Maryland has done, EP, well, EPA has, has, they haven't required it, but they have asked all the states to put together a managed pollinator protection plan, or MP3. Um, so what Maryland did, um, we had a meeting. I don't know if anyone here uh, was able to get to that meeting or was invited to that meeting, but we did have a stakeholder meeting. Um, we had about 130 people there, uh, industry, beekeepers, um, uh, government, um, general public, uh, ag folks as well. Uh, about 130 people um, a few weeks ago. And um, I'll tell you, I, I was, I've been with the department for 15 years, so I may have gotten a little cynical, so I wasn't expecting much out of this meeting, but I was really impressed with, with, with the turnout and with, with actually how it went. Um, you know, going into the meeting, a survey was put out to everybody who was, who was invited to the meeting. Um, and one of the questions was listing, you know, what, what, what you thought was causing the, uh, the reduction in pollinators, um, you know, whether it be pesticides, habitat, mite. Uh, whatever it might be. Um, pesticides was at the top. Um, by the time the meeting was over, they asked the same exact questions. Um, pesticides was down on the bottom. Um, so it was, uh, you know, varroa mite, habitat, loss of habitat, um, starvation, um, nutrition. It, it, you know, pesticides were, I mean, they, they, were, they were down the list now instead of right up here. But uh, but anyway, what, what we're going to do is uh, we've received a, a, a summary of this meeting from, from the folks that helped put it together for us. Uh, we're looking over that summary now. Um, Ashley, um, Ashley came in, I guess you could say, at the right time for, for me and, and for my chief, Dennis Howard. Uh, maybe at the wrong time for her because we kind of threw her under the bus with this. We threw it on her lap. Um, so she kind of took, uh, <coughs> took, took this and, and ran. And she's hoping to have a plan finalized this spring. This is a best management practice, best management plan. Um, this is, we have no intention of making this an enforceable document, um, but it'll be Again, just, just a BMP for you all to use um, as far as pollinator protection goes. I will add, um, on the enforcement side of things, complaint-wise, in the 15 years I've been with the department, um, we've had three B complaints. Um, one was an ag complaint uh, that turned out not pesticide-related at all. Um, one was a homeowner complaint who swore that his neighbors were reaching over and, and spraying the bees um, because his bees didn't leave his yard. So the only way they could be dying is if they, they were spraying them. Um, again, no, no pesticides were found on the hive. Uh, he did have a lot of bees dead outside the hive. Uh, 
and, and that's one kicker for us. We will sample bees. Unfortunately, the state chemist uh, who we submit our samples to wants a pound of bees. You know how many bees are in a pound? <laughs> um, we have done it with less, but, uh, but because of the sampling procedure, I mean, the samples, I mean, basically they run the analysis three different times, so they do need a fair bit of sampling done. But um, no pesticides, well, no pesticides were found on the hive. No pesticides were found on the bees. Uh, we did some soil sampling as well around the hive. We actually found DDT. Um, but um, <laughs> very, very small trace amounts. And we attribute that to uh, he had some soil brought in a long time ago. Uh, and it was still, we were still picking up trace amounts. Um, and the third complaint just happened uh, this past fall. Um, again, it was a, a, a homeowner complaint. It was against a mosquito control company. Um, and it, it was kind of a broad complaint. It wasn't, uh, well, they were spraying. It was basically they're spraying my area and they're killing all the bees. We found no dead bees uh, in his area. Um, after doing a label review, uh, on what the company was using, and they were using a bifenthrin product, Tolstar, and uh, a what we call 25B, which is a minimum ri risk, which ended up being, it was garlic oil. Uh, we did cite the company for a label violation on all things the garlic oil. Um, so uh, the, um, the, the, the product that did not require pest uh, a registration from EPA ended up being the product that did them in. Um, so he was cited for a misuse of label violation uh, on the garlic oil because it stated on the label, do not spray if rain is forecasted. Now, that is a very broad statement. Um, now, what made it a little easier, it did rain within an hour. So, um, but, uh, uh, so we were able to cite him on that. Why would you put garlic oil in there? Is that meant to be good against mosquitoes? It's a mosquito uh, repellent. Now, I can't tell you. The 25B products are not required to be registered by EPA, so they do not go through any of the, the testing that EPA normally would do on a registered pesticide product. Now, they do have to be registered in, in, in Maryland, but 25Bs are generally just registered. There's, there's no efficacy, efficacy testing or anything like that done. But, um, so we don't know what the efficacy is. We don't know whether or not it's going to work. Um, you know, we have, we, we've gotten a lot of complaints from the 25B products, as with a lot of states have, because a lot of them are, your, are essential oils, and, and your peppermint, your, your clove oils, uh, spearmint oil. Um, we've had people chased out of their homes um, just because the smell was so overwhelming from, from, from the, uh, we went into one home, it was peppermint oil that was used and, um, for, for bee control. For, uh, they had uh, wasps in the attic. And um, I'll tell you, you walked in that house and my eyes were watering, the nose was burning. I mean, you just about, and they did nothing wrong. They, everything was applied according to labels. So, but again, as was, was uh, said before, make sure you read that label. Um, so no matter what the product is, that's, that is one thing we are looking at, so. But hopefully we will finalize this in the springtime. And again, it is a BMP. We have no intention of making it a um, regulatory uh, enforceable document uh, at this point in time. So uh, one thing to keep in mind too, uh, th this, this was going on uh, last year. Uh, they, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife were petitioned uh, uh, to list monarchs as an endangered species. Uh, they have gone through their review. Uh, their comment period actually ended back in December. Um, we haven't heard where this has gone. Um, and uh, so, I mean, really, if, if, if this is enacted, it, it could you limit, limit some applications across the board, no matter, no matter what your uh, business is. So, but we'll keep you apprised on this, uh, what, on what's going on with that as soon as we hear something new. Um, and real quick, uh, for those of you that have been participating in our pesticide recycling program, thank you. We collected about uh, 30 tons of plastic last year. 
um, across the across the state. And um, have any of you in here participate in our disposal, pesticide disposal program, unwanted, unused. So I've been getting a lot of calls lately. Um, I haven't had money in my budget for that since 2011. Uh, and the only reason I got that was because Mary Ellen Setting came up to my office because she got a few calls in and all of a sudden I was doing a program. So if, if well, I would like to do that. <laughs> But my attorneys may say otherwise. But th that is the plan. So what I'm getting at, sorry, long story short, I know we're over. If you have anything and you've got something that you really need to get rid of, um, you know, call the department, send Secretary Bartenfelder or Deputy Secretary I, I, geez, I forgot his name already, I coursed a, um, an email, tell them you want to reinstitute this program. Um, my goal is if I can get enough people, I would like to do uh, where we have an area staged where the, you guys come to us versus me go to every single location. Because in 2011, we went to 57 different locations. That's all. And, <laughs> and um, in 18 different counties. So we, we, covered, we tried to cover the whole state, or we, we, the whole state was allowed to participate. So, But my goal is to get enough people that I can talk our attorneys into having you guys just come to us like, like the household hazardous waste programs. So anyway, I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> yeah.